Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Open Data Institute. My name is Ellen Broad. I'm our Head of Policy here at the ODI. For those of you uh, who this is your first time joining us, just a couple of housekeeping things. The hashtag, if you're following on Twitter and you want to contribute, is ODI Fridays. Uh, this lecture is being live streamed and recorded, so just so you're aware in case that affects the questions you might ask. There will be time for questions at the end. Um, and I think I can now just jump straight into introducing our speaker today, who I'm personally really excited about. It's John Griffin, the founder of Achai, a digital consultancy, and of Dataseed, which is what he's going to talk to you about today. And I first came across John actually via an introduction from James Cattell. And what I love about Dataseed is, A, um, it gives you a really simple way of visualizing data, but it also has been a really useful tool for kind of showing back to people um, how you can improve your spreadsheet management and what good data practice and bad data practice looks like. So I've just found it incredibly useful not only as a tool but as like an educational tool as well. So without further ado, I'm just going to turn straight over to John. Thank you, Ellen. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I guess I'm going to talk to you um, today mostly about some of the issues that our customers of Dataseed um, have come to me and um, presented to me about using open data, really. Um, and um, I want to start off, first of all, by just running through an example, um, a specific example, which is quite a good example, actually. This is when things go quite well. Um, so this is a customer of ours called Kate, um, who runs a small business and wants to find out more about G Cloud. So for those who don't know, G Cloud is a government procurement framework the idea is it should help small businesses do business with government um, easier. So, um, so in this scenario, Kate wants to find out a bit more about, okay, who's selling on G Cloud? What are they selling to whom? For how much? Um, so let's go along this journey. So um, the first thing she does is a Google search for G Cloud statistics. Um, the first result here that's not an ad is this one. Um, and going into this page, it's a nice, clear gov.uk page that gives us at the top some sort of totals. Um, and then straight away, we've got lots of links to download CSVs. Um, so also on this page um, is linked through some of these charts here. So um, these are performance dashboards, as they're called. And these are really good. I mean, um, you know, for a start, you can see straight away the total amount that's being spent on the G Cloud framework um, by different company sizes, et cetera. What it doesn't give you is um, the insight into exactly sort of who the customers are, who the suppliers are, that sort of thing. So, um, so we go back, we download one of these CSV files, and we pull it um, into Excel. It looks like this. It's pretty regularly laid out. Um, it seems sane but it's about 70,000 rows, so we want to visualize it. So in this case, um, we're gonna use Dataseed to do that. Um, it's a pretty simple process of just dragging the CSV file in. Other data visualization software is available, I should say, but um, I want to just kind of show you this specific example, um, and it applies you know, all over the place. Um, so this is <coughs> excuse me, a visualization that's been created with Dataseed of this data set. Um, so you can see all these charts here are showing the total amount that's spent. So we can see in the top right, the line chart here is showing us the total amount spent is going up over time. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, we can see SMEs have 
slightly larger proportion of business than the large companies. So that's good. You know, GCloud's kind of doing what it should be doing in that respect to an extent. Um, so this is good. I'm going to pop out of the presentation now and go into the browser so that we can get a bit more interactive with this and follow this through a bit. So this is the same visualization, just um, the interactive version. Um, so what Kate might want to do at this point is to look at some particular suppliers that are competitors of hers. Her business sells CRM software, so we might look up Salesforce in here. Find Salesforce, we can just filter down all these charts are clickable so we can filter and see straight away. Okay, so there's a really lot of money there being spent on Salesforce, um, 580k. Um, the biggest customer is London Borough of Hounslow Council. So they spent 621k in total. If we click on them, we can see one transaction back here, 1st of June, 500k. Then another transaction, so that was 2013 there. Another transaction here, 1st of June, 2015, for 120k. Um, so, not really sure what the reason is behind that. You know, maybe they just realised they were paying far too much in the first place. Um, you look at some of the other customers down here. They're paying, you know, generally kind of 50, 20, down to a few thousand pounds here. So this is all really good information that Kate can use to make business decisions on. Should I go through the pretty kind of it's a pretty epic sign-up process for G Cloud. Um, so, you know, we can decide whether we're going to proceed with that based on the data that we can look at here. So this will work pretty well. This is an example of getting some open data, getting some answers out of it, and um, doing that all pretty quickly with minimal pain and friction, really. Um, but we need to ask some questions um, before we can kind of draw conclusions. So um, is there any missing data? How was the data collected? Now, on that page where we downloaded the CSVs, it's pretty good um, about giving us information on this. It tells us that the data was um, submitted by suppliers. <clears throat> so if you supply on the G Cloud framework, you have to self-report how much um, you're getting paid for things. So, um, OK, we trust that people are doing that. We have to. Um, how are the terms defined? Well, they also define what an SME is. They don't really define any of the other terms, but, you know, um, it's pretty good. Sorry, go back. What's the license? So it tells us also it's under the Open Government License, which is a pretty permissive license and allows us to use this data um, in various ways. So um, this is, by all means, a pretty good example um, here. Um, but these are all issues of data quality. Um, and data quality is it's not you know, a perfectly defined term. People kind of use it to mean different things. Um, but um, what we're looking at here now is uh, the results of a study done by the ODI. Um, and I think you know, the question here was, to businesses who are making use of open data, which factors affect or you know, um, influence your decision to use open data by the look of this here? Um, you know, people, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong about any of these things. Um, so um, you know, these are all important factors that you know, most of which I would put under the banner of data quality. Um, the accuracy of the data, we can't do much if it's not accurate. Um, licensing, can we use it? Um, how can we use it? Ease of access, I mean, that, that sort of comes down to how easy is it to find and then to um, reuse that. You know, does it change over time, how it's published and the format? Provenance of data, where did it come from? Um, what process has it been through before it gets to us? Um, and the format of the data, this is what I'm going to focus on primarily. Um, and, you know, specifically how machine readable the data is, um, because I feel like this is really a low hanging fruit. Um, and this is, you know, specifically what our customers um, complain about the most, really, or, you know, where they get stuck when they're trying to get some insight out of open data sets. So, um, bit harsh, but, you know, um, what is standing in the way, basically? Why can't we always just go through that process that we just did with the G Cloud datasets and kind of 
get some answers pretty quickly. Um, I mean, there's lots of problems, obviously, but I'm going to focus on spreadsheets um, and the fact that they are basically just a collection of cells. And you can do um, some pretty horrendous things with that freedom. Um, so CSV files specifically, if we talk about um, because you know, there's lots of ways of publishing data, obviously, and um, I don't have a problem with CSV files. I've done a lot of work with um, linked data in the past, and you know, there's some great formats out there which um, you know, solve all these problems, but the problem is they're not really that well adopted. So you know, CSV's got a lot going for it. It's open, simple. Everyone can open them, really, with software they've got on their computer already, and we're already using them. Um, but yeah, you, they allow you to put anything in them. So that's the bane of our life basically. Um, so yeah, I want to kind of run through some specific issues which come up again and again. Um, <clears throat> and um, you know, there's only five or six of these. And I guess you know, these are things that I feel could be quite easily solved, um, and indeed are being solved. Um, so I'm not kind of proposing anything that's not already a solved problem here today. It's more about um, encouraging the adoption of solving these problems, um, or the technology that solves these problems. Um, so, problem number one. Red is bad, by the way. Green is good. Um, sorry if you're red, green, green color blinds. Um, the top one is bad. Um, so, having multiple files, or having to deal with multiple files, is an issue for a lot of people. Um, they simply won't go beyond that. So, um, you know, the first thing is, if we can have just one single file, that really helps. Of course, it might be massive, the reason people split things up is it, you know, um, you might only want to look at a section of the data and that's fine. Um, you know, both is preferable. Um, but, you know, for people to stitch files together, in a lot of cases, if they have to write some code to do that, that's going to be a big blocker and they're just not going to get past that. Um, second, Simply character encoding. Um, just use UTF-8 is really the short answer. Um, so um, yeah, moving swiftly on. Um, I've called this non-normalized schema, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but what it really means is, you know, the top example here, we've got columns here for each year. And you see this quite a lot. Um, and, you know, what do these numbers mean? So I need to go and look at some metadata or something to interpret what these numbers here are telling me. Um, you know, presumably they're sales, right? So um, in this case, so we could transform the data into how it looks beneath, where we have a column for year. And this schema is never going to change then. So, um, you know, the number of columns is never going to change. That means, you know, um, it's machine readable in the sense that whatever we do to read that data doesn't have to change over time, um, which is really handy. Um, yeah, this is another one as well, which is kind of annoying. Um, introductory text or any text before header row. Um, you know, it's a convention that you just have the header row at the start um, of your CSV file. And, you know, introductory text is metadata, essentially, which should live alongside the data set rather than in it. Um, empty cells, you see what I did there. Um, so yeah, um, this is you know, the, probably the most egregious error because it's a data accuracy issue. You know, we could perhaps guess that in that space there, it should say SME, but we're guessing and um, you know, we might get it wrong. <coughs> duplicate terms here. Yeah, so you'll see on the left-hand side, we've got education spelt in various different ways. Um, presumably, these should all be grouped together. You know, they're all the same thing. Um, but again, some data cleanups got to happen at some stage here. Um, you know, we've got to group these things together somehow. And, you know, if you visualize this straight away, these are all going to show up as different categories. Um, it's just unnecessarily annoying, really. Um, so yeah, um, so these are the kind of things that we just see time and time again, constantly, and are all really easy to solve-ish, or you know, 
there are initiatives to solve them already. Um, so, I mean, as a practical sort of stopgap solution, yes, we can use tools like OpenRefine. So, you know, if you're coming across this issue now, then OpenRefine is a great solution to that. But ultimately, the situation that we're in is everyone's doing this cleanup themselves, and we're all duplicating this effort. It would be much better to sort of get this right at the source. So, yeah, I just... Um, you know, I want to sort of just point out some of the ways in which people are already solving this problem. It's not a new problem by any means. You know, this problem has been around as long as data has been around, to be fair, I imagine, some, some way or another. So um, CSV Lint is a really great tool. Um, it's, a, it's available online, you know, at this address here, csvlint.io, uh, but it's also open source, so you can download it, run it. Um, basically what it is, it's um, a schema, so... Um, you know, you have a separate file, which is a JSON file that lives alongside the CSV file, and that describes what the CSV sh file should look like. Some things are, you know, simply best practices that people should be aware of already. Um, you know, header row at the top, um, you know, number of columns throughout the table should be consistent, things like this. It should be UTF-8. Um, but it also does things like check the type of each Field. So, you know, you might have a date field or you might have a text or a number um, and it'll check that that's consistent throughout. Um, so, um, or, you know, you might have fields which are required um, so we don't get those empty cells there. So really, this pretty much solves all the issues we just looked at, um, apart from the duplicate terms. So the duplicate terms um, really require us to have another list of, you know, which terms we're expecting to see in that column. So, um, I mean, solutions here might be using registers, um, which are canonical lists of things, um, companies, buildings, etc. Um, or, you know, there's lots of other vocabs from the linked data world um, that could be used here. So, um, again, this is a sort of, it's really a problem that's existed forever in database design, uh, relational databases. It's really a foreign key to another table um, without getting too technical. Um, you know, there's, we basically just want to reference from our data set a list of other things. So um, you know, some way to do that would be really great. Um, and of course, then tools like CSV Lint could check the integrity of that link and make sure that we're not having, um, that we are kind of linking to genuine things and rather making up terms on the fly. And this spreadsheet just kind of gets out of order. Um, the other thing I want to mention is ODI certificates, which already kind of cover all this stuff um, in a sense. You know, they cover a lot of the data quality issues which we talked about earlier. Um, they also, you know, make reference to the machine readability of the data. So um, it kind of seems like if we were to see uh, more adoption of, you know, all of this stuff, then the quality would increase immensely, you know, overall. Um, why is it important? Well, because, you know, at the moment we've got, we've done really well on the quality, on the quantity problem. You know, we've got lots and lots of open data out there. But, um, and you know, companies are actually making use of open data um, to, to just kind of clean up that data and to make it presentable to ordinary citizens, you know. Um, and that kind of feels like to me that it should be something that, you know, it's something that there are kind of, you know, many important people, you know, Francis Moore, there are many kind of um, pieces of legislation like this that talk about open data being for citizens, for citizens to be able to understand, you know, what the government's doing um, and be able to have access to this information in order to make better decisions. And at the moment, I feel like, you know, these issues are really getting in the way. Um, yeah, it's the low-hanging fruit, basically. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to solve these things, I feel, and um, that's good news. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, if we were to um, solve these things, and really we could make open data more accessible, more useful um, to millions more people. Um, yeah, so um, that is... All that I really want to say, um, I think I'm going to wrap up there and then we'll take questions afterwards. Um, 
Thank you all for coming.